it's almost Halloween. Crazy, right? And one of the traditional Halloween monsters is the werewolf. And while we don't have any werewolf stories today, we do have the werewolf's first cousin, Dogman. Today, we have five brand new Dogman stories. This encounter comes in from Eddy County, New Mexico, and the poster wishes to remain anonymous, so we're going to call her Kristen. Kristen was raised in the deserts southeast of New Mexico on two different ranches. She and her family always lived on very remote ranches, 50, sometimes 75 miles away from the nearest real town. She used to track semi-professionally for hunters and the local trapper. So she is very well versed in the flora and fauna of their beautiful state. She knows the critters of New Mexico. And Kristen's story starts in April of 1999. She and her boyfriend were rooming with a couple in a trailer just outside of Lakewood, New Mexico. And for a few weeks that April, a lot of the neighboring landowners were complaining about wild dogs coming up from the river and harassing their dogs and scaring their livestock. And where Kristen was living was about a mile from the Pecos River. And wild dogs were a real problem in the area. One guy had even reported some structural damage to one of his chicken coops. The couple that Kristen lived with had two dogs. They were medium-sized terrier mixes. And neither one of them were on the cowardly side. But they'd been getting very, very skittish about leaving the trailer at night. So much so that they had to make sure that they let the dogs out right before sunset. And then again, right after sunrise because the dogs wouldn't leave the trailer when it was dark. And one Saturday night, about 11 p.m., when the four of them were just sitting around watching TV and talking about stuff, the dogs, who were asleep in the master bedroom on the east side of the trailer, started growling and barking at the window on the south wall of the room. And this is really odd behavior for them. So everybody got up from the living room and went to the bedroom to find out what the ruckus was all about. And by the time they get there, the dogs seem to have shifted the focus of their barking from the window to along the whole south wall of the bedroom. It's like they can smell that something is there outside and it's moving. So they're moving with it. And when they get to the edge of the bedroom... They just go nuts. And suddenly from farther down the hall where the kitchen is, they all hear this super loud thump and scuffling noises. It's powerful enough that they actually feel it move the trailer. And the dogs at this point just completely lose it. They cry out in this high pitched whine and just dive under the bed and everyone runs out of the bedroom down the hall and into the kitchen to see what the hell's going on and trying to look out the kitchen window is pointless it's late there's cloud cover and the moon isn't even out that night and they hear that scuffling noise again and confused they all kind of wander toward the living room to see if they could figure out where these sounds are coming from and Kristen says what happened next seemed like it happened in slow motion. Appearing in the living room window and looking right on in at them was, she doesn't even know what. From the shoulders up is what she can only describe as a man dog. The shoulders are quite human with short, sleek hair, but it has the head of what looks to be a Rottweiler and the teeth, holy, crap the teeth on this thing all four of them scream at the same time and Kristen guesses it scared it off because it disappeared but that image will forever be seared in her head and remember this is a trailer house so the bottom of that living room window is at least six feet off the ground making whatever was looking in the window at least seven feet tall no dog or wolf is big enough to stand up and look at him that way through the window. And the guys, being guys, immediately grab their shotguns and head out the door, even though Kristen tells them that's a bad idea. Super dark night, 
big unknown critter? Nope. But they're out there for some 20 minutes or so looking for this thing until they come back inside saying they couldn't find anything. The light coming from the living room window and shining on its face because it was so close to that window is the only reason they saw it to begin with. None of them really sleep well that night. The next morning, Kristen decides to get up early and go outside and see if she can find any tracks outside that might help them figure out what that thing was. The grass and the weeds that are growing up right next to the house pretty much hide any tracks that it would have made there. But she does discover claw marks on the side of the trailer toward the bottom. And she figures that's probably what made those thumping and scuffling sounds the night before. She then decides to follow the tracks that the guys made, which is when she makes a second, very unnerving discovery. The guys had made clear tracks in the sandy dirt, and whatever was out there did as well. The other tracks were huge, canine, and switched back and forth from four legs to two, meaning that at least part of the time, it was walking bipedally. And by following those tracks, she could see that whatever it was, was pretty much circling the guys the entire time they were out there. This story takes place in the northern Michigan town of Reed City in 2007. Sam and his two friends are out hunting, each of the three positioned in their own stand. And it rolls around to about 4.30, and the sun is starting to set. And Sam notices all of the sounds of the natural forest creatures have stopped. And silence hangs in the air for a minute. Until it's broken by three deer crashing out of the wood line past Sam's stand, followed by a wave of an awful odor that smells like mothballs. And that's when it appears. A hulking, hunched over, yellow-eyed, two-legged cryptid breaking from the bushes in open pursuit of the deer. Sam stays put until his friends arrive. And he tells them what he just saw. And his friends, they just make fun of him. And after Sam's friends have run out of punchlines, the three of them head home and return the next day. The day is pretty much event-free until about 5 p.m. That's when Sam hears shots being fired about 100 feet away, followed by screaming coming from his walkie-talkie. His friend, in total panic, describes the exact same dogman that Sam had seen the day before. Though thankfully, it ran away this time as well. Now, either these boys lack foresight, or they are way braver than I am, because they come back for two more days of hunting. The third day of hunting is completely quiet in terms of dogman-related matters. The fourth day, however, proves that this thing is still on the prowl. This time, the pseudo-werewolf doesn't even wait until noon before it runs out into the middle of a clearing right in front of two of the three hunters. And it sees the hunters and it looks directly into their eyes and starts grinning. Sam's friend aims a gun at the beast and it takes off immediately, growling and hissing as it goes. About an hour later, the third friend radios in and says, um, guys, are you in a werewolf costume by my stand? Cause it's not funny. Before Sam can even answer, he hears five shots ring out in the distance. And the third friend is safe, but Sam reports that he had deep, distinctive claw marks in the butt of his gun. At this point, they decide it might be prudent to pack up for the night and head home. And when they get back to their cabin, the trio can see that the snowy ground is littered with big, huge canine paw prints and the same claw marks embedded in the front door of the cabin. (laughs) 
This story comes from Worcester County, Massachusetts. And the writer is anonymous, so we will call her Elaine and her husband, Gary. Back in 2004, Elaine and Gary were given three of their grandchildren to raise. The children were boys aged one and a half, three, and four and a half years old. And the boys were followed a few months later by a sister, a newborn who was also given to Elaine and Gary to raise. So all of a sudden, after having raised their own children, they find themselves new parents once again. And they lived in a small town in New England. So small that you could step out onto the front yard and you could see the police department, the fire department, and the post office. Her grandmother and father were born in that town. And Elaine lived there for six decades. It's the kind of place where if you need some vegetables for supper, you go to your neighbor's garden, pull what you need, and leave the money on the porch. And they lived on Main Street, but they were surrounded by a lot of forested area. Three rivers run through that town, and they had a huge field behind their house. There were many fields in the town, and many farmers too, and in the neighboring towns. They were very New England-type towns, small and comfy and cozy. When the children first come to live with them, both Elaine and Gary have jobs. He works at a transit company in a neighboring town, and she is a paralegal. And Elaine's job is a four-hour commute. Two hours in the morning, two hours at night. She's gone from the house for 12 hours hours a day at a minimum. And she often works weekends too. So Gary takes a leave of absence from his job and stays home with the kids for two and a half years. And when he does return to work, he works the night shift so he can be home with the kids during the day. And he does his best with the kids while Elaine's gone at work. And given the circumstances, he does a pretty good job. One day after work, when the youngest two kids are six and four, Elaine comes home and finds the house is a total mess. Supper hasn't been made. And the kids come running to her with some story about a big gorilla that was running through the yard that day. The two youngest tell her that during the afternoon, they saw a big gorilla running along the street in front of their house. And it was super fast. And then the big gorilla jumped their picket fence, and ran in their yard. And the children said they had their noses pressed up against the window and that the big gorilla came to the window and growled at them and pushed its paws against the window. And they said they had tried to wake up Gary, but he'd fallen asleep on the couch and would not wake up. The big gorilla then ran into the backyard where it busted some car windows and threw some garbage cans around. And Elaine doesn't disbelieve the children. She's just far too exhausted to deal with it at the moment. So she responds with her standard, that's nice, comment, which she uses any time there's something that she just can't handle right now. And she does recall reading the newspaper a few days later, where police were warning local residents of some vehicle damage and vandalism that was going on. But she doesn't give it any further thought. Elaine doesn't give it any further thought, even though years prior to the gorilla incident, she had seen a huge wolf dead on the side of the road, presumably hit by a car. It is not a coyote or a coy dog that they also have in the area. She had seen pictures of wolves And this one was immense. And Elaine had personally seen koi dogs out on the trail while she was riding her horse. And the wolf body was gone the next day. And there was no mention of it by any authorities or in the newspaper. And she thought that was kind of unusual. I mean, did they have wolves in the area? Because that might be kind of newsworthy. Did anybody else see this wolf? Obviously somebody had because the body was gone the next day. Elaine doesn't give it any further thought. Even though years before the children came, she and Gary had both seen very large canine footprints 
around their house. They mention those prints to a friend of theirs who's an animal control officer in a neighboring town. But he didn't seem real surprised by their fine, and they never discussed it anymore. Elaine doesn't give the big gorilla story any further thought. Even though, about the same time they saw the big dog prints in their backyard, their cats had started to go missing. She found one of their cats, Peter, the best hunter in town, up on their neighbor's third-story roof. She called to Peter, but no luck. Elaine then managed to get in the house and go up to the second floor, and she climbed out onto the second-floor porch with a wash basket where she raised it above her head and up to the gutters of the house, and Peter obligingly dropped in. Thankfully, they managed to save their cat. One of their friends even asked, what was Peter doing up on the roof? He's not afraid of anything. But Elaine is still not connecting the dots. Back to the big gorilla story. When the children get a little older, they move to North Carolina. It's in North Carolina where the kids are near to teen years, where Elaine stumbles across a Dogman Encounters program on YouTube. And she listens intently to the stories featured on those programs. And one day, while she's driving down the street, the dots all connect in her head. The idea jolts her and her brain awake. Wait a minute, she says. Did they say... Big gorilla and something very fast? When they told me that gorilla story? Did the children have an encounter with something all those years back? So Elaine immediately talks to the 12 year old and the 14 year old separately. Do you remember the time you told me about the big gorilla? And the 12 year old energetically tells her everything that she can remember about that day. The animal was very large and very fast. It had black hair and a long bushy tail. It growled. It had paws with fingers and it stood up and pushed on the window with those paws. It ran very fast and had jumped over the fence. Then it ran into the backyard, breaking things and making a lot of noise. And the 12-year-old said it didn't really have the face of a gorilla or a monkey, but she couldn't tell anything more about the face because of the hair. So then Elaine asked the 14-year-old, who just shivers. He says he will never forget that thing coming into their yard. He remembers it as if it were yesterday. He, too, remembers the swiftness of the creature, the black hair on it, how it jumped the fence and was running amok between the front yard and the backyard. He says he didn't know what it was back then, and he still doesn't know now, and hopes he never sees something like that again. The children now know about Bigfoot and Dogman and cryptids. They didn't know when they saw the big gorilla, though, and neither did Elaine. They've all received an education since then, and they're aware that dogmen don't always stay in the forests, that they are often seen in neighborhoods. And perhaps, just perhaps, the creature that Elaine's children saw all those years ago is just that, a dogman in a small New England town. This next story is crazy because it comes from a guy who claims that Dogman has been following him since he was young with two separate incidences 20 years apart. He doesn't want to give his name, so we're just going to refer to him as Brian. Now, his first encounter takes place in 1988 in the town of Alto, Michigan, which is just outside of Grand Rapids. Brian is in elementary school and he is outside playing at recess at about 10 in the morning. And he and his friends are playing war. And Brian decides to run into the forest adjacent to the elementary school to hide. And he makes his way to a river by some railroad tracks when he hears a huge splash and he sees a dark-haired dogman bolt into the forest 
sometimes on two legs, sometimes on four, before it disappears completely. And Brian is so freaked out that he completely forgets about recess and school and runs straight home to hide in his bed. And he keeps silent about that encounter for years until he's an adult. And he describes what he saw as being about eight feet tall and maybe 300 pounds, blue eyes, and it seemed almost like a timber wolf, but upright and with longer legs. And that brings us to the second sighting, which takes place in a nearby town called Lowell in the winter of 2008. Brian now has a family, all sleeping soundly, until he hears a thud from up on the roof. And for whatever reason, the noises above his head spark an explosion of memories about his first encounter, bringing back that fear to the forefront of his brain. But willing his legs to move, Brian goes into the front closet where they keep a machete for protection. He grabs it, quietly slips out the front door, and looks up. And that is when the very same blue-eyed dogman pokes its head over the edge of the roof and stares directly at him. The creature leaps off the roof like 30 feet and bolts on all fours till it gets to the tree line, where it stands up and stares back at Brian. Brian, feeling a surge of adrenaline at the idea that his family is now in danger, runs full out, wielding the machete right at the dogman. The dogman just stares at him, almost grinning, before he utters one audible word. Don't. Brian stops dead in his tracks and is overwhelmed by this weird sense of calm. He drops his machete and backs away slowly as the dogman turns around, walks into the woods, and disappears. <laughs> This story comes from another anonymous poster. We'll call him Alan. Alan and his partner Mike are experienced Bigfoot investigators and are in a very unique situation in that they have a family group located in their research area around Pulaski County, Missouri. In one October, during a full moon, he and Mike are out on their usual hilltop location, where they're having a lot of success that night, tracking two juveniles and an adult. At least those are the only ones they know about. They can hear the giants walking in the leaf litter. And every now and then, they can hear a clack or a wood knock from different directions. And after a while, Alan and Mike can feel a change in the wind as the fun attitude that was there before kind of evaporates and an attitude of caution sets in instead. And Mike hears something in the trees off to the north, so he takes off to go investigate. And Alan stays back at camp just in case it's some kind of diversion. And Mike comes back in a rush and tells Alan that he just saw one of the juveniles run out of the tree line and across the fire break. And Mike says what he sees following that juvenile out across that fire break, he can't even comprehend. It's about six feet tall with pointy ears and a long snout. Now, Alan confesses that neither of them have ever given much credence to the dog man, wolf man, grass man theory. He just thought that those reports were mistaken identification of a Bigfoot or a bear. Coincidentally, Alan had just purchased a 40 caliber pistol with some hydroshock ammunition for it that is sitting in his truck. And after Mike explains what he has seen, Alan 
goes to the truck, gets the gun, and loads it. And all the while, they can hear the two young ones chattering and the big one stomping around in the trees behind them. They can sense that the Sasquatch are pissed about something because they never act that way around Alan and Mike. And Alan says to Mike, take me down to the fire break area where you saw this thing. And with spotlights, they scan the area and they can hear something moving around and a few short growls. Finally, Mike catches it with the spotlight as it's going between trees. And what Alan witnesses he swears he never would have imagined seeing anywhere except on a movie screen. A six foot tall wolf walking on its hind legs. Alan fires his pistol in the air and the creature turns and runs into the woods. And they wait a while, but they don't hear anything else. So they cautiously head back to their camp, but they can hear this thing pacing them the entire way back. And once they hit camp, they hear this thing continue to approach them. And Mike turns on the spotlight and Alan levels his gun where the sound is coming from. It is approaching them without fear. And it feels to both of them like it's stalking them in the same way that it was stalking the juvenile Bigfoot earlier. It comes out from between the trees and Alan shoots it square in the rib cage from 20 yards. And he sees the wound explode in its chest. So he knows he hit it and it falls to the ground. But it immediately gets back up and runs into the woods. And they can hear it crash through the brush. And they even hear it fall down or trip over something but it pretty much continues to run in a southerly direction down the hill, paralleling the fire break. And both Alan and Mike are freaked. So they just break camp and leave. The next morning, Alan loads up a few extra clips for his gun and the two men go back to the same spot where they saw it the night before. They wanna track it and see did it die or did, was it just wounded? What happened to it? And they track it from the point where Alan shot it down through the canyon. And they even found the spot where it had fallen down and, and made a bunch of ruckus. The leaf litter is all upended everywhere and it makes it pretty easy to track. At one point, they find a perfect canine footprint on a mud ridge, but it is over eight inches wide. And the thing that absolutely baffles both of them is that there is no blood anywhere on the trail. None. They both saw the bullet hit. They know it was wounded, but no blood. And they keep tracking it all the way down the canyon till they lose the trail. As Ellen mentioned before, neither he nor Mike have ever put any credence into the Dogman reports. But he does know that whatever it was that they saw, he never wants to see it again. And he never goes into the woods unarmed. If you want to keep your Halloween holiday party a raging with more Dogman stories, click here. Be careful out there, and we will see you again on The In Between. Yeah.